Evolution is not inevitable, contrary to what is sometimes argued. Um, there is a piece that was written in um, Evolution News and Views uh, called Peer Reviewed Science, A Mathematical Proof of Darwinian Evolution is Falsified. And uh, that just came out uh, this month. Uh, this is one that is well written and rich enough that I'll go through the entire thing, adding one or two things along the way. Due to the tradition of professional scientific writing, major developments in scientific literature often arrive muffled in language so bland or technical as to be totally missed by a general reader. This along with the media's habit of covering up for evolution is how large cracks in the foundation of Darwinism spread unnoticed by the public, which goes on assuming that the science is all settled and will ever remain so. Which, of course, we are assured all the time. A case in point is a recent, journal in, a recent article in the Journal of Mathematical Biology, a significant peer-reviewed publication from the influential publisher Springer. The title of the article announces The Fundamental Theorem of Natural Selection with Mutations including a verb would presumably be too much of a concession to populist sensationalism. Yet the conclusion, if not sensational, is certainly no noteworthy. Generations of students of biology and evolution have learned of the pioneering work of Ronald A. Fisher. A founder of modern statistics and population genetics, he published his famous fundamental theorem of natural selection in 1930 laying one of the cornerstones of neo-Darwinism by linking Mendelian genetics with natural selection. Wikipedia summarizes this contributed, this contributed to the revival of Darwinism in the early 20th century revision of the theory of evolution known as the modern synthesis. So this is one of the founders of neo-Darwinism and this is his, in a, in a sense, magnum opus. Fisher's theorem offered as, uh, as what amounts to a mathematical proof that Darwinian evolution is inevitable now stands as falsified. His idea is relatively easy to state. It goes, the rate of increase in fitness of any organism at any time is equal to its genetic variance in fitness at that time. So if you have a population that's all one, then there's going to be no change. If there's a broad variety of organisms, then the change is going to be relatively rapid. Not, uh, not necessarily the number of organisms, but the variety of them. His proof of this was not a standard mathematical one. Fitness is not rigorously defined, and his argument is more intuitive than anything else. The theorem addresses only the effects of natural selection. Fit Fisher did not directly address any other effect, mutation, genetic drift, environmental change, etc., as he considered them to be insignificant. Later mathematicians took issue with Fisher's lack of rigor, some at considerable length, and we'll see some of that later on, but the omission of the effects of mutation got the most attention. Now along comes mathematician William F. Basiner and geneticist John C. Sanford. Uh, most of you may recognize John Sanford, uh, who propose a, a, an expansion of the fundamental theorem to include mutations. Basiner is a professor at the Rochester Institute of Technology and a visiting scholar at the University of Virginia's Data Science Institute. Sanford is a plant geneticist who is an associate professor at Cornell University for many years. He is an editor of the volume Biological Information New Perspectives, which we reviewed in class. The Journal of Mathematical Biology is the official publication of the European Society for Mathematical and Theoretical Biology. 
So this is, you know, highfalutin up there. Um, by the way, uh, John Sanford apparently funded a good share of the, uh, the uh, colloquium that produced the volume Biological Information New Perspectives. And William F. Bessner was one of the authors in that uh, book. Yes. Is it eight years an awfully long time to include mutation in the theorem? Seems like mutation's been known about for a very long time. Well, of course, um, to be fair to uh, Fisher, he wrote his theorem in 1930. Uh, DNA itself was not discovered, or at least uh, the DNA code until 1953. So, yeah, it's been a while. Um, but if the theorem is still, um, as, um, as we were discussing earlier, the theorem is still uh, uh, used to hammer people over the head. Well, all you need is, th is variance and natural selection, and the population will improve, and that proves evolution. Bessner and Sanford expand the Fisher model to allow both beneficial and deleterious mutations following and extending earlier work. So other people have done that too, but not to the same extent. They use zero mutation levels to test their model's agreement with Fisher's, and it does. They establish that there is an equilibrium fitness level where selection balances the mutation effects. However, if mutations at biologically plausible levels are used, well, what happens in the real world? Overall fitness is compromised. In some cases, this leads to mutational meltdown where the effect of, in fact, in all known cases. Um, but they're, they're not saying that. Uh, this leads to mutational meltdown where the effect of accumulated mutations overwhelms the population's ability to reproduce, resulting in extinction. Extinction is the opposite of evolution. They conclude, and I uh, want you to pay attention to this because I'm not going to repeat it at the end of the article itself. We have re-examined Fisher's fundamental theorem of natural selection, focusing on the role of new mutations and consequent implications for real biological populations. Fisher's primarily, primary thesis was that genetic variation and natural selection work together in a fundamental way that ensures that natural populations will always increase in fitness. Fisher considered his theorem to be essentially a mathematical proof of Darwinian evolution, and he likened it to a natural law. Our analysis shows that Fisher's primary thesis, universal and continuous fitness increase, is not correct. This is because he did not include new mutations as a part of his mathematical formulation and because his informal corollary rested upon an assumption that is now known to be false. That is that uh, mut beneficial and uh, deleterious mutations are roughly equivalent. We have shown that Fisher's theorem as formally defined by Fisher himself is actually antithetical to his general thesis. Apart from new mutations, Fisher's theorem simply optimizes pre-existing allelic fitness variants leading to stasis. Fisher realized he needed newly arising mutations for his theorem to support his thesis, but he did not incorporate mutations into his mathematical model. This is before people really realized what mutations were all about. Um, so I'm not blaming Fisher for that particular problem. Uh, Fisher only accounted for mu new mutations using informal thought experiments. In order to analyze Fisher's theorem, we found it necessary to define the informal mutations element of his work as Fisher's corollary, which was never actually proven. We showed that while Fisher's theorem is true, given the uh, assumptions, his corollary is false. In this paper, we have derived an improved mutation selection model that builds upon the foundational model of Fisher as well as on other post-Fisher models. 
we have proven a new theorem that is an extension of Fisher's fundamental theorem of natural selection. This new theorem enables the incorporation of newly arising mutations into Fisher's theorem. We refer to this expanded theorem as the fundamental theorem of natural selection with mutations, which is why the title of their paper. After we reformulated Fisher's model, allowing for dynamical analysis and permitting the incorporation of newly arising mutations, we subsequently did a series of dynamical simulations, testing it out, involving large but finite populations. Um, the reason why is because infinite populations can be modeled. Finite populations uh, involve statistics and uh, and therefore are better tested as computer simulations. Um, we tested the following variables over time. Populations without new mutations, that's the original F Fisher thesis. Populations with muta mutations that have a symmetrical distribution of fitness effects. And populations with mutations that have a more realistic distribution of mutational effects, with most mutations being deleterious. Our simulations show that apart from new mutations, the population rapidly moves towards stasis. It doesn't keep getting better and better because there's no better to be had. With symmetrical mutations, the population undergoes rapid and continuous fitness increase, and in fact, accelerating uh, in fitness increase. And with a more realistic distribution of mutations, the population often undergoes perpetual fitness decline. Symmetrical means what? I'm sorry, that symmetrical means what? Symmetrical means that there are as many beneficial and of the same kind as there are deleterious. And that's measuring fitness by how many offspring you produce. Is this unfair to a historical figure? What about models developed after Fisher? In the light of Fisher's work and the problems associated with it, we also examine post-Fisher models of the mutation selection process. In the case of infinite population models, what has commonly been observed is that populations routinely go to equilibrium or limit set, such as a periodic orbit, which is chaos theory. They do not show perpetual increase or decline in fitness, but are restricted from it, from either behavior because of the model structure. An infinite population with mutations only occurs, uh, only occurring between pre-existing genetic varieties. In other words, you have to keep getting new mutations in order to make this work. On a practical level, all biological populations are finite. In the case of finite population models, the focus has been upon measuring mutation accumulation as affected by selection. Finite models clearly show that natural populations can either increase or decrease in fitness depending on many variables. Not only do other finite mathematical population models show that fitness can decrease, they often show that only a narrow range of parameters can actually prevent fitness decline. This is consistent with very many numerical simulation experiments, numerous mutation accumulation experiments, and observations where biological systems have either a high mutation rate or a small population size. Even when large populations are modeled, very slightly de deleterious mutations can theoretically lead to continuous fitness decline. What they mean to say, um, and I might add, but maybe don't dare, is stated most bluntly early in the, earlier in the article. Because the premise underlying Fisher's corollary is now recognized to be entirely wrong, Fisher's corollary is falsified. Consequently, Fisher's belief that he had developed a mathematical f proof that fitness must always increase is also falsified. <coughs> or maybe I should say it is invalidated. But that's the biological reality, coming back to our commentary. Fisher's work is generally understood to mean that natural selection leads to increased fitness. And while this is true, taken by itself, mutation and other factors can and do reduce the average fitness of a population. According to Bessner and Sanford, at real levels of mutation, Fisher's original theorem, understood to be a mathematical proof that Darwinian evolution is inevitable, 
is overthrown. Excuse me. Kudos to Bassiner and Sanford for making this important point. Now, will the textbooks and the online encyclopedia articles take note? Well, I would say don't hold your breath on that. <clears throat> well, what is the article they're talking about? It's Bassner and Sanford in the Journal of Mathematical Biology. Since it's in uh, online, they don't have page numbers yet, um, but it has been published online. Um, the abstract reads, the mutation selection process is the most fundamental mechanism of evolution. Um, in fact, you can argue that it is the, basically the only one that's reasonably available. Uh, in 1935, R.A. Fisher proved his fundamental theorem of natural selection, providing a model in which the rate of change of mean fitness is equal to the genetic variance of a species. Or to be more precise, it's equal to a constant times the rate uh, of uh, the vari variation, variance. Fisher did not include mutations in his model, but believed that mutations would provide a continual supply of variants, resulting in perpetual uh, increase in mean fitness, thus providing a foundation for neo-Darwinian theory. In this paper, we re-examine Fisher's theorem, showing that because it disregards mutation and because it is invalid beyond one instant in time, it has limited biological relevance. We build a differential equations model from Fisher's first principles with mutations added and prove a revised theorem showing the rate of change in mean fitness is equal to genetic variance plus a mutational effects term. We referred to our revised theorem as the fundamental theorem of natural selection with mutations. Our expanded theorem and our associated analyses, analytic computations, numerical simulation and visualization, provide a clearer understanding of the mutation selection process and allow application of biologically realistic parameters such as mutational effects. The expanded theorem has biological implications significantly different from what Fisher had envisioned. That's a very polite way of putting it. They begin their, their article. R.A. Fisher was one of the greatest scientists of the 20th century. He is considered to be the singular founder of modern statistics and simultaneously the principal founder, I think that should be A.L., but of population genetics, followed by Haldane and Wright. Fisher was the first to establish a conceptual link between natural selection and Mendelian genetics. This paved the way for what is now known, what is now called neo-Darwinian theory. At the heart of Fisher's conception was his famous fundamental theorem of natural selection, Fisher's theorem. Fisher's theorem, published in his text, The Genetical Theory of Evolution, showed that while, a pop, uh, while the given a population with pre-existing genetic variants, that is, Mendelian alleles, uh, the population's mean fitness will increase. Not only will the mean fitness increase, the rate of increase will be proportional to, that's a better way of phrasing it, the genetic variance for, of fitness, for fitness within the population at any given time. This constitutes a proof that natural selection leads to increasing fitness in an idealized, in idealized Mendelian genetics. Although it is often overlooked that Fisher's theorem does not consider mutations and without newly arising variants, natural selection can only lead to stasis. By itself, Fisher's theorem seems obvious and of little significance. The impact of the theorem came from the following two points. One, Fisher conceptually linked natural selection with Mendelian genetics, which had not been done up to that time. And two, Fisher assumed that when combined with a constant inflow of new mutations, his theorem guaranteed unbounded increase of any population's fitness. Therefore, his, in his mind, the theorem constituted a mathematical proof of Darwinian evolution. And countless people have used it in precisely that way um, afterwards. At the time of Fisher's work, there were two competing schools of thought about genetics and evolution. The biometric school 
viewed genetics as quantitative and continuous, fully understandable solely by statistical metrics and a vague notion of Darwinian gradualism. The Mendelian school of thought viewed inheritance as the transmission of discrete Mendelian units. Hence, evolution was thought to progress by discrete steps. In describing Fisher's goal in his text, Plotinsky writes his aim was to vindicate Darwinism and to demonstrate its compatibility with Mendelism, which a lot of people thought uh, were incompatible. Indeed, the ne its necessity given a Mendelian se system of inheritance. Fisher wanted to show that the established reality of the discrete units of Mendelian inheritance did not undermine Darwin's Darwinian evolution, as some were arguing, but actually supported it. Uh, Fisher's derivation of how natural selection and Mendelian genetics can work together. Fisher's model and the assumptions he placed on his model system have been investigated by numerous authors. It is generally accepted that while Fisher does not clearly state his assumptions about his system, it is possible to create a model system consistent with his work in which the proofs of his theorem is valid. Price summarizes various perspectives as follows. Also he, Fisher, spoke of the rigor of his de derivation of the theorem and the ease of its interpretation. But others have verily, variously described his deri derivation as recondite and very difficult or entirely obscure. And no one has ever found any other way to derive the results that Fisher seems to state. In other words, you can't find it, a, you can't use a different proof to get to the same result. H hence, many authors, not reviewed here, have maintained that the theorem holds under, only under very special conditions, which is, I think, what the, this article will be arguing. While only a few, have thought that Fisher may have been correct if we could only understand what he meant. <coughs> that it will be shown here, this, this other author, that this latter view is correct. Fisher's theorem does indeed hold with the general, generality that he claimed for it. The mystery and the controversy result from incomprehensibility rather than error. Notice he is right, you just have to accept it because it's, it's too high for you. Um, well, actually, until I got, came along and I explained it to you. Um, that's, uh, in a way, that is very comforting for an evolutionist because, yeah, the, the theorem is still true. You just, you just don't understand it. <laughs> I've heard that one before, too. Uh, Fisher's model assumes many simplifying but unrealistic assumptions that define the limited generality that Price describes. For example, Fisher's theorem requires the assumption of zero dominance and zero epistasis. That means uh, that when you, d you have perfectly, uh, uh, that the, uh, the dominance means that uh, uh, all of the uh, all of the mutations that are there are all of the variations because we're starting with them. They're not mutations in Fisher's model. Um, uh, can be seen by uh, by natural selection, but seen precisely in proportion to their. Uh, their influence in the fully recessive state. And then zero epistasis means that they don't have any influence on each other. Price posits that Fisher defined dominance and epistasis to be environmental effects, which makes the theorem correct in this restricted level of generality, but limits its application as a fundamental rule uh, affecting biological species, as Fisher later claims. Ewens confirms the validity of Fisher's theorem in this level of generality. I'm going to start skipping over stuff here um, because otherwise we'll be here until noon or so. Um, there is actually a formula that summarizes Fisher. Um, uh, and there's the formula. And uh, where M 
uh, bar is the average fitness of the population. The sum is over uh, every locus, I would say, uh, why they use loci, I'm not sure. In the genome, um, A sub Y L is the allele for the organism Y at locus uh, L. And Q 1A is the increment, Fisher's terminology, that is the, the advantage in fitness associated with allele A at locus L defined by Fisher to be the difference from the mean fitness that an organism will gain by having the allele at this locus. So yeah, there is a, there, and, and I'm just, I just gave you a taste of it, so I'm, I'm not going to try to go through all of the mathematics in the paper. Fit, Fisher's meth, measure of genetic fitness of each organism Y depends on the con, constituency of the population as a whole at that time his theorem cannot be extended to a dynamical model over time um, because as, as we talked about before, the dynamic model has to have a finite endpoint. Um, this combined with his modeling, ignoring important effects such as epistasis does not invalidate Fisher's theorem but it makes his theorem inconsistent with his conclusion about how it applies as a universal law of evolution to all biological populations over time. It's a limited theory. Fisher clearly claimed that his fundamental theorem should be as universal as entropy in thermodynamics. And here's a quote that kind of uh, gives you the flavor of that. It will be noted, noticed that the fundamental theorem proved above bears some remarkable resemblances to the second law of thermodynamics. Both are properties of populations or aggregates, true irrespective of the nature of the units which compose them. Both are statistical laws. Each requires that the constant increase of a measurable quantity, in the one case the entropy of a physical system and in the other the fitness, measured by the M of a biological population, as in the physical world, we can conceive of theoretical systems in which dissipative forces are wholly absent and in which entropy, the entropy con consequently remains constant. So we can conceive, though we need not expect to find, biological populations in which the genetic variance is absolutely zero and in which fitness does not increase. Professor Eddington has recently remarked that the law of entropy always increases the second law of thermodynamics holds. I think there should be a comma there or a period or something. Um, I think the supreme, uh, let's see, the law that entropy always increases the second law of thermodynamics. Yeah, that should be the law that entropy increases, always increases, comma, the second law of thermodynamics, comma, holds, I think, the supreme position among the laws of nature. Um, this, that's the way it is in the original, well, in the paper. It is not a little instructive that so similar a law should hold the supreme position among the biological sciences. So from Fisher's perspective and from a lot of people who follow Fisher, uh, evolution's inevitability is every bit as secure as the second law of thermodynamics. Skipping over, I'm sorry, skipping over um, paragraph, what is often overlooked is that without a constant supply of new mutations, selection can only increase fitness by reducing genetic variance. That is, selecting away undesirable alleles, eventually re reducing their frequencies to zero. This means that given enough time, selection must reduce genetic variance all the way to zero apart from new mutations which is true, given enough time. According to Fisher's theorem, at this point, effective selection must stop and fitness must become static. This evolutionary scenario not only results in a minor increase in fitness followed by terminal stasis, or only results. Apart from a constant supply of new mutations, Fisher's theorem would actually suggest 
that Mendelism has killed Darwinism. A common view in Fisher's time. This is precisely the opposite of what Fisher wanted to prove. Fisher's theorem with mutations. Well, what happens when you add the mutations in? In terms of Fisher's primary thesis, we cannot overstate the essential role of new mutations and their fitness effects. Fisher's theorem by itself actually shows that, apart from new mutations, a population can only op optimize the frequency of the pre-existing alleles, followed by stasis. Yet Fisher argued forcefully that his theorem was so fundamental in its nature that it essentially guaranteed that any population would increase fi in fitness without limit, essentially constituting a mathematical proof that Darwinian evolution is inevitable. How could he make this argument? To make his theorem meaningful, Fisher had to assume a constant supply of new mutations. He understood that both deleterious beneficial mutations occur, but argued against the effects of deleterious mutations. For example, if therefore an organism be really in any high degree adapted to the place it fills in its environment, this adaptation will be, will be constantly menaced by any undirected agencies liable to cause changes to either party in the adaptation. The case of large mutations to the organism may first be considered since their consequences in this connection are, I don't know why they're uh, sick, is because that's standard English spelling. But anyway, are of a, an extremely simple character. A considerable number of such mutations I have now been observed, and these are, I believe, without exception, either definitely pathological, most often lethal, in their effects, or with high probability to be regarded as deleterious in the wild state. This is merely what would be expected on the view, which was regarded as obvious by the older naturalists, and I believe by all who have studied wild animals, that organisms in general are in fact marvelously and intricately adapted, both in their internal mechanisms and in their relations to external nature. Such large mutations occurring in the natural state would be unfavorable to survival, and as soon as the numbers affected attain a certain small proportion in the whole population, an equilibrium must be established in which the rate of elimination is equal to the rate of mutation. To put the matter in another way, we may say that each mutation of this kind is allowed to contribute exactly as much to the genetic variance of fitness in the species as will provide a rate of improvement equivalent to the rate of deterioration caused by the continual occurrence of the mutation. It keeps getting selected out. He reasoned that mutations were, that were seriously deleterious would easily be selected away and so could be ignored. Beyond this, he loosely suggested that the downward impact of fit on fitness must be balanced by the upward impact on genetic variants. Uh, I'm not sure how that works, but. In mutation selection population models, as described in section two, there is a balance between the downward effects of deleterious mutations and upward effect of selection that balances out in most, in infinite population models, but not in finite population models. Our main theorem, theorem two, provides the rate of change of mean fitness into two terms, the first being the genetic variance and the second being a decrease in fitness from mutations. And the two are not equal. After arguing that large mutations are generally deleterious and can be ignored because they are self-eliminating, Fisher argues that mutations with small net effects have a nearly equal chance of being deleterious as being beneficial. Adaptation, I'm just quoting part of what he had to say, may be shown to imply a statistical situ a situation in which the probability of a change of given magnitude affecting an improvement decreases from its limiting value of one half as the magnitude of the change is increased. So the assumption is that when you get really down to the very small mutations, half are beneficial, half are deleterious. Having argued that the effects of large mutations can be ignored, he argues that the small mutations have a net effect that was effectively neutral. The net effect approaches zero as the size of the effect approaches zero with 50% of these mutations being beneficial and 50% being deleterious. Fisher does not consider any mutations other than those with large deleterious effects and those of small, nearly neutral effects. It is now clear Fisher was wrong regarding the effect of mutations. Research since that time, described in section two, shows that the mutations with immediate fitness effects have the greatest impact 
or intermediate effect, fitness effects have the greatest impact on long-term fitness. This has been shown in models demonstrating it in, the lab, in laboratory experiments and has led to antiviral therapies, which we'll talk about briefly. Uh, at the time Fisher wrote, the distribution of mutational effects was not understood, and so his fundamental assumption was incorrect. They're equally, well, especially the small ones, are equally beneficial as deleterious. Fisher's primary area was that he sincerely believed that mutations by themselves could continuously restore genetic variants without affecting fitness. And then selection could always translate the replenished genetic variants into increased fitness. It is very significant that new mutations were not part of Fisher's mathematical formulation. He only added mutations as an informal corollary to his theorem. Although Fisher did not explicitly make the distinction, for clarity we need to separate Fisher's theorem, no mutations included, from Fisher's corollary, mutations included. And Fisher's corollary, um, Fisher's fundamental theorem plus a steady supply of new mutations necessarily results in unbounded fitness increase as mutations continuously replenish variants and as selection continuously turns that variance into increased fitness. <laughs> the term corollary is justified here because Fisher believed that if Fisher's fundamental theorem is true, which it is given uh, the, uh, the assumptions, then the corollary is true as a necessary logical consequence. Fisher never derived his corollary mathematically. Moreover, most modern evaluations of Fisher's theorem focus on the theorem itself and do not address the role of mutations. Again, skipping over a little bit. In order to understand Fisher's theorem in light of newly arising mutations, we need to reformulate the original theorem to allow for incoming new mutations. The goal of this paper is to develop a version of Fisher's theorem analogous to that presented by Crow and Kimura, but with the additional capacity of tracking the effects of mutations to new genetic varieties over time. This new formulation is proven as theorem two, which we'll see in a minute, where we derive a formula that gives, rate, uh, gives the rate of change of mean fitness as a function of both the variance of fitness and the mutation effects on population fitness. Since the premise underlying Fisher's corollary is now demonstrably wrong, it is a foregone conclusion that Fisher's corollary is false, or at least invalid. Mutations are not effectively fitness neutral, not even when all large deleterious mutations are eliminated by selection. So Fisher's conclusion that natural selection with mutations necessarily results in increasing fitness is not true. So when you, people come up to you and say, well, if there's variance and there's selection, then uh, the population has to improve and therefore uh, there's variance and there's selection and so the population is improving. Just simply is not true. Uh, mutation selection models, a review of the literature. Uh, um, this of course is my ellipsis, I failed to color it. It seems most population biologists have reviewed uh, have viewed Fisher's theorem as being simply out of date and of modest historical interest. Yet theorems should not just fade away. Mathematically, they should be upheld, refuted, or corrected. Our goal is to correct and reapply Fisher's theorem such that it is consistent with real biology. Which I think is an admirable goal. Skipping on down. Deterministic versus non-deterministic models infinite population models. He's got uh, quite a bit to say on that. Um, I'm, I'm skimming through a lot of this at this point. Um, while the quasi-species equation always has an equilibrium and the form of the equation holds the total population fixed at carrying capacity, the idea that a high mutation rate causes the population to spread out over lower fitness genotypes has led to effective antiviral therapies in which the increase in mutation rate causes extinction of the population. Antivirals that go in, get into the viral replicating machine and cause mutations. And you don't have to plan this as to which mutations they're going to make. You just 
allow any mutations to take place, and the viral population disappears. So the theory that they're talking about not only works, but can be used. Skipping on down, adaptation is only possible if the mutation rate per base is less than the inverse of the genome length using appropriate units. That means that we should have one mutation per person per generation. The number is closer to 100. Oops. Finite population models. An early significant step in finite population models was the simple thought experiment that in a small asexually producing population, no parent can have offspring more fit than the parent. Beneficial mutations are insignificant compared to deleterious ones, and back mutations are rare. It is possible that through random chance the most fit class of organisms might not produce offspring as fit as the parents, and the genetic makeup of this class would then be lost. The next most fit class could suffer the same fate, and so on until the population loses fitness needed for population survival. This is pointed out by Mueller, 1964, and termed Mueller's ratchet by Feldenstein, with each click of the ratchet being a loss of the most of a most fit class. <coughs> the predominance of deleterious mutations over beneficial <laughs> ones is well established. James Crow in 1997 stated since most mutations, if they have any effect at all, are harmful, the overall impact of the mutation process must be deleterious. Wow. Studies across different species estimate that apart from selection, the decrease in fitness from mutations is 0.2 to 2% per generation, with human fitness decline estimated at 1%. That's not evolution. How long did humanity survive? Um, that'd be interesting to calculate, actually. If we're losing 1% per generation, um, how many kids could a couple have at the beginning? Let's say 20. And then all you'd have to do is uh, multiply that on down. And pretty soon you're going to have a, uh, uh, you know, eventually you're going to get to where you're producing less than two kids per couple. And when that happens, the uh, population will dwindle and finally disappear. It's happening in Europe. It's happening in Europe already. Sure. Yes, in Russia it's particularly bad. Although some of that's cultural, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. well. Yeah, Butcher concluded that this contradicts previous work that indicates that epistasis will halt the ratchet. So no, epistasis will not halt the ratchet, and it keeps going. This is further supported by Baumgartner et al., 2013. Wait a minute. Baumgartner et al., 2013? That happens to be quoting his book, Biological Information, New Perspectives. What he is doing now is he is mainstreaming that book. It's in the peer-reviewed literature, therefore Baumgartner is cited in the peer-reviewed literature, therefore the book has been cited, and in fact, if you watch carefully, you'll see a number of 2013 papers that uh, are included. Uh, uh, in fact, there's another one just down, uh, the, the, down the paragraph, which shows that in simulations with biologically realistic parameters, synergistic epistasis does not halt genetic degeneration, but actually accelerates it. Likewise, Brewer et al. 2013 shows that related mechanisms such as the mutation count mechanism fail to halt genetic degeneration. Brewer 2013 is again part of that book. Conceptual selection models. 
uh, modeling natural selection with mutations. There's a whole bunch of stuff in here, and of course some of that quotes some of these people. Differential equations with mutations, the fundamental theorem of natural selection with mutations. Bassiner is a mathematician, so he's having fun here. And uh, that leads to this theorem too, which is the revised Fisher taking in, in, into account uh, mutations. Um, analytic solutions, numerical simulations, um, I mean, they go through a whole bunch of stuff here. Simulations with no mutations in a short time span, simulations with no mutations in a long time span. What happens is the short time span actually does work Fisher's way. The long term, you run out of mutations. Um, simulations with a Gaussian distribution for mutational effects, that is uh, symmetrical, and actually uh, evolution takes off at that point. It, it e increases exponentially. But if they're not Gaussian, if there's more like a gamma distribution, which is the real way mutations uh, are distributed, then uh, in terms of theorem two, the downward pressure from mutations overwhelms the upward pressure of selection. We observe that it is, we observe that it, I think it should be, uh, is problematic to define parameter settings that are biologically realistic, yet results in continuous fitness increase, supporting the modeled buildup of very slightly deleterious mutations described by Kondrashov's paradox. And if you don't remember Kondrashov's paradox, he wrote a paper that says, why are we not dead 100 times over? <laughs> and it's cited in, in the literature. That's right. Discussion. Arguably, R.A. Fisher was the singular founder of the field of population genetics. His book, The Genetical Theory of Natural Selection, established for the first time the connection between genetics and natural selection. Within that pioneering book, Fisher presented his famous fundamental theorem of natural selection. This is basically f the formula, um, oh, I'm, I'm going to omit. That's, that's, the, that's all the discussion will go in. We've already read the conclusion. And in the interest of giving you a little time to discuss, I'm just going to say this is basically the formalized genetic entropy thesis with mathematics to back it up it got into the peer-reviewed literature. If one grants that there is on average over one mutation per reproduction, and that deleterious mutations are more likely than one in a thousand, then the genetic entropy thesis follows logically. Uh, Sanford's book is now cited, uh, now, you know, wait a minute, Marx was the main editor. Well, yeah, but Sanford funded the thing and held the conference at Cornell and really was a, the major, I think, driving force behind the conference and therefore behind the book. <coughs> it's nice when you're getting money from patents on genetic uh, inventions. <laughs> um, and so Sanford's book is now cited in the peer-reviewed literature. It's gonna be a lot harder to ignore, but uh, again, I wouldn't hold my breath on uh, people conceding the point, even though the geneticists all know it's correct. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Me. Pardon me? Is that his genetic entropy? Yeah, the, the uh, well, uh, actually it's, it's his biological yeah, uh, thing, the, uh, mm -hmm. new, new perspectives, biological information, new perspectives. That's the one that we reviewed. Well, actually, we reviewed both of them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, his book, Genetic Entropy, I don't know if it has been cited by anybody that's been cited by somebody, but the biological information, new perspectives is cited all over the place by this. And of course, Baumgartner got involved partly because Baumgartner is actually a computer uh, scientist. Mm -hmm. uh, created the, um, the Terra program, which is 
uh, well known and used mm -hmm. by people doing research on on uh, mantle dynamics and stuff. It's probably the best one out there right now. And both of those have been lecturing here at Loma Linda several times. Yeah, yeah, including a couple of times uh, for Baumgartner and once for uh, Sanford, I think, here in uh, in our Sabbath school. Sure. Excuse my ignorance. It seems a lot of these studies hop in life at midstream. I want to know why why a mutation, the very first one, where was it headed? I mean, what road map was it going to be a flower or a pig? Uh, well, of course, nobody could really say that. Uh, and I wouldn't expect them to do that. Uh, but I would say this, and that is um, uh, the very few mutation, if it's on a par with all the other mutations, has a 99.9 .9 plus percent chance of being deleterious. If the very first organism barely was good enough to survive, then you sure hope it doesn't have uh, mutations until it has time to reproduce itself. And yet, if you think about it, supposedly genetics back then was more susceptible to mutations than it is now. We have a lot more protective um, devices to make sure that the mutations uh, don't happen now than we did supposedly then. So that kind of you know, if that's the case, uh, it means that the first organism shouldn't have survived either. That's, you know, the hill you've got to climb, you get on, to, you get on top of the mountain, you finally cl climb uh, uh, Dawkins Mount Improbable, presumably from the backside because the front side you, you can't climb it. Um, you finally get there, and the first thing that happens is a gust of wind knocks you off. Um, it is well documented that members of any population who are in any way deficient in the repair mechanisms for the various mutations um, are almost invariably severely uh, handicapped yeah. at best. Yeah. So then the question that arises is how did <laughs> these organisms supposedly evolve before the repair mechanisms evolved. Well, th that is just another statement of the irreducible com complexity argument, isn't it? I mean, you have to have this and you have to have that and you have to have something else and then you have to have something to hold them together so that it doesn't deteriorate mm -hmm. before it can reproduce. Uh, I don't think you can win. Yes. Uh, just curious, did uh, Sanford in this uh, latest report uh, use the 99.9% .9 figure? Yes. He does. Uh, he does. And he, and he points out that according to the geneticists who know, that's conservative. Yeah, well, definitely. I mean, it goes up to a million sometimes. <laughs> yeah, and some of them say it's so small it can't be measured. That's just, if you think about it, that's amazing. That means that well over a million to one probably are deleterious. And in that case, all that natural selection can hope to do is to break even. At best. At best. Now you think about it, basically you're standing over a bridge on a very wide river. In the middle of a river is a water strider. The water strider is trying to swim upstream. The river is carrying the water strider down. There are two things that you can say. Number one, the water strider did not get where he is 
by swimming upstream. Okay, and number two, if the water strider stays in the middle of the river, he's gonna go over the falls at the end. It's that simple. So even given, say, beneficial mutations, I don't, I don't, is it discussed at all that you still, if, if you believe in constantly mutating things, you still have to preserve the beneficial mutation long enough uh, to build something new, you know? So you have to have all these mutations. Uh, I, don't, I don't get how they can assume it's all going in the right direction and not going back and forth, back and forth. And, and you know, once you get it and then it stays that way to then coincide with another beneficial mutation. So do they discuss that at all? Well, like I say, if you grant, one, that there are deleterious mutations, and two, that they happen in a uh, massively more likely form than beneficial mutations, then the only way the natural selection can make headway is if there is less than one mutation per organism on the average. Because you have to be able to stay where you are in order to get upstream. And if there's on the average more than one uh, a mutation, then, the, then they're all deleterious. You're coming downhill, you can't make it. If the water strider cannot swim faster than the current, then the water strider cannot go upstream. In fact, if the water cannot, a strider cannot swim as fast as the current, no matter what the water strider does, the current's gonna carry him down. And basically, it is not only a proof against evolution, but it is also a proof against long ages. That's right. Because it means we couldn't be, have been here for so long. We could not have managed to stay where we are for that long a time. And I think that it is that insight that has turned John Sanford not just into an intelligent design advocate, <coughs> but into a short age creationist. Short age meaning less than? Less than, oh, 10,000 years. I, I mean, if you want to be precise about it, less than one million years, but you know, who's arguing over that? The only way that you can get, uh, I mean, you could have, uh, for example, God creates a new species every million years or something like that. But species in the record are supposed to have lasted for 10, 15, 100 million years. Uh, if that's the case, they shouldn't be that long. And so, if you have a species that's living for 100 million years, that 100 million years is illusory without God's direct intervention. And the whole point of making this thing was to not have to have God continually intervene. If you've got God in the picture, then why are we fighting this? Uh, yes. Qu uh, question here. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I understand this concept of the infinite size population versus finite. A uh, related question I have to that is, would this affect the bottleneck concept in that if you have relatively few people within a, within a population because they went through a bottleneck, uh, then the population is not large enough to have truly beneficial mutations appear anywhere within the population, therefore it can't make it, can't drive itself throughout the population. Well, basically the concept is that, um, that if you have infinite population, then you can have a bell curve of fitness that goes out forever in both yes. directions. You can always find something that is more fit. 
you could yeah and uh, so uh, therefore you could you could theoretically push the curve up as far as you wanted to but, but that but goes it, directly in violation of a finite universe well yeah it's uh, and, and in fact a finite population uh, because the fact of the matter is we don't know of any organisms that have infinite numbers. Um, and, 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 and so it's a billion. So it's a quadrillion. So it's whatever. But there is a limit to the number of uh, genomes of any particular organism. And therefore, if you're truly going to model biological processes, you have to model them in... Um, in a finite analysis. I mean, if you think about it, uh, if there are, you know, let's say four quadrillion organisms of a particular kind, then you can only have four quadrillion different genomes. I mean, that's just all there is to it. Some of them could be roughly identical, um, but uh, but you are not allowed infinite variation. And see, the, the Fisher hypothesis depends on there being a non, uh, in, an infinite number of variations so that you can push things a little bit and you push it again and you push it again and you push it again. But if you have only a limited number of genomes, then you can push it up to the one billion or one trillion or whatever it is, uh, you know, however far out you go in the standard deviations thing. And um, you, know, you can push it that out that far, and then you simply you run out of places to push it. So that without without mutations, Fisher does not prove in inf infinite evolution. It proves evolution up to an ideal, and that's it. So a <coughs> couple of follow-up uh, questions to that, and that is, um, w would this also suggest that any emerging species would have to remain in reproductive connection with a large population because anything that's isolated, that, that separates itself out and is a small population, a small population seems like very quickly would go extinct. Um, so, so then my third question is, is like what about rapidly reproducing populations like insects, for example? Um, wouldn't we expect them to have been extinct by now? Um, actually, it would be interesting to do a, a, an analysis on that and see how far along we are. Would that be uh, a fairly easy computer program to write? Probably. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Mendel's accountant is already out there and you can download it and so uh, you might not even have to write the program. You just simply have to find reasonable parameters to put into it and then turn it on and let it run. Uh, the truth of the matter is most people have not been interested in that kind of modeling. Because they don't give the outcome. Because they don't give the outcome they want. And it, you can <laughs> see every once in a while people in the field saying things like Kondrashov, why are we not dead? A hundred times over. Uh, maybe it's because there hasn't been enough time for degeneration to take place. Yeah. Um, the, the issue of infinite populations, besides being unrealistic, because you have a finite universe, it's not possible to have an infinite population of anything yeah, in a finite not universe. Have more than 10 to 80th organisms. Whatever it if, is. Even if every particle turned into an organism. But even, but you see, once you invoke infinite anything and you select any portion of the infinite, you still have the infinite. Mm -hmm. The infinite doesn't become significantly less simply because you selected a bunch out. Well, so it, it's a it's it's almost like cheating uh, with with the the logic here because mm -hmm. if you invoke infinite because yeah. under infinite conditions special rules apply you can no longer 
uh, expect outcomes the way you would under less than infinite circumstances. Well, uh, I mean, mathematically, you can uh, you can model it uh, to where there's one third of an organism, one tenth of an organism, one hundredth of an organism, uh, but but again, that's not a realistic. Uh, but but one tenth of infinity is still infinity. Uh, <laughs> yes, that, yes, that's a problem. But as long as as long as you're dividing it out, you're you're still okay. <laughs> that was that's the principle of calculus: is that the, is that you, you go you, to smaller any, and smaller intervals, and you can get as close to as you want to to, uh, for example, a differential, which is where it started see, out. See, if you multiply infinity by any constant, you still have infinity. That is it doesn't true. matter whether the constant is a fraction well, the constant or a multiplier of any kind. The constant can reduce in proportion to infinity. And so I would, I would Unless say you're that dividing infinity by infinity, in which case you have an yeah. undefined operation. <laughs> and then you have to do a limits analysis. Right, but it, the, the point of it is limits analysis can be done. Yes. Now, now the, 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 the real point behind this is that, in fact, we don't have infinity. That's the, that's the And, and uh, certainly on Earth we don't have infinity. Uh, I mean, I could conceive of an infinite universe of which we can only see a part, and uh, maybe there is, you know, uncounted numbers of whatever, but certainly nothing that we can see. And we are limited to what we can see, and we don't know of any organisms anywhere in the universe other than in our, on our own Earth. Uh, and, you know, uh, those religious people who, you know, you can ignore them. Um, and so, at this point, uh, we can limit ourselves to a finite population of people. You know, or maybe it's 10 billion right now, but it's, but it's, but it's not a hundred billion, you know? And the same thing is true for insects uh, of various <laughs> kinds, for all the insects for that matter, for all the bacteria, that you can take the Earth's weight and divide it by how big a bacterium is, and that is the maximum number of bacteria that you can have on Earth under idealized theoretical circumstances. And of course, in reality, the bacteria are not going to go below a couple miles at the maximum and uh, for practical purposes probably uh, you couldn't pile bacteria more than about uh, oh probably about a foot around the earth uh, even even allowing for bacteria in the ocean and stuff so that basically what it boils down to is that, that there there are finite limits and you have to take them into account in any realistic model of biology. Yes? Um, not coming from a scientific, I'm trying to sort of glean something from all of this and digest it, but um, I was thinking that in all the studies, people seem to be studying it as if it's, um, they're, they're studying everything outside of the, fa the effect that sin and the choices of man have on the rates of mutations. And, and so they, they remove, it's just all science, right? You take a population of something, you study it, thinking that there's nothing outside of that that it's affecting it. But the fact is, is that sin comes into play, which affects mutations and affects everything. So I don't know, it's just. No, you're, you're correct in that. Actually, what's happening is that, that the uh, effects of sin are specifically denied. Yes, yes. And, uh, but even allowing for that, you still have people like Kondrashov who recognize that you don't have to call it sin, but there is a deteriorating principle of some kind and that it is at work, demonstrably at work, and that if you leave it alone for a long enough time, it's going to kill all of us. But that, that's so amazing that I just see science, if, they, if there's an honesty, and then that's another factor. Mm -hmm. Am I willing to look at truth, mm -hmm. honestly, and then that takes the element of something outside of this whole picture, which is the Spirit of God working on the heart, to make it honest enough to look at 
things as they really are, not as I want them to be. Yeah. Yeah. They're baby steps, but they're there. Uh, we have a couple of comments over here. If we can. Um, um, we, we talked. <laughs> <laughs> you were there Sweet. first, actually. No, but, we'll yes, but I have to be. I have to, be, <laughs> yes, yes, I have to honor him. Um, we talk about theory, yes, mutations, da da da. But we should be able to show it that there's beneficial mutation. Show us one. Well, they're going to say, well, look at um, um, sickle cell anemia, you know, don't get malaria. Really? You have seen folk in your emergency room with sickle cell yeah. crisis, and you cannot walk away from there without a tear in your eyes. Yeah. These folk don't make beyond 35 years. I mean, what is uh, just one, just one medically beneficial um, mutation? Perhaps maybe there is, but could it be that that's an infinite God who stops this? If indeed we're going to go that way? No, or else is there really no beneficial mutation anywhere that's evident? Well, I think we've, been at, we've asked to be independent of God, and God has granted yeah. us our wish. And, right. and it is, uh, therefore, uh, we're living with the consequences of our choices. Right. Well, I talked about one out of every four couples in Europe seek fertility, go to fertility clinic. Why did they open up the doors to 800,000 Syrians going to Germany. Because they needed the people. Yes. So what's happening? You see, are we really getting better? Are, are we? Well, the Syrians are obviously better genetic stock in Yeah, it, and so. it's gonna last for, <laughs> it's gonna last for some time. It's gonna last, it, it is gonna last for some time, you know, but it's gonna still go down the same way because their eating habit is gonna change. Yeah. Uh, just an, <laughs> I'll try and get along on one. Uh, uh, need to keep in perspective that survival of fist does still work on the very simple level and that uh, I don't didn't see anything in these figures about redundancy in the genetic code and yeah. uh, why have we survived so long possibly because of these those simpler factors and the fact that there's built-in redundancy in a lot of things. Yeah. And that uh, sometimes um, uh, degenerative factors are beneficial due to environmental, odd environmental situations. So the picture's a little more complex uh, than this, but this is an overwhelming uh, slime at uh, evolution and whole as a whole, uh, yeah. and I I, I I was following the wording through there. Uh, uh, Sanford was very clever in his insinuations through that oh, paper. Yeah. How how he got it through the peer review. Uh, uh, well, it's viewers, because he, is, uh, he didn't stick his conclusion up front. He, but it's it's right there. It's boy. there. It's there. And it's, and. Uh, 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 and uh, the data and let the data speak for itself. Yeah. No. Yeah. And and that's what he does. <laughs> he he presents the data. Uh, he lets the data speak to, for itself, and then he. Uh, <coughs> um, and then uh, I mean, the thing of it is, Sanford is right. And if you don't <coughs> rub it in their faces, which they're careful not to do, Sanford and Basson are both, uh, then, uh, then they really don't have an argument to stand on. Because the fact of the matter is he's quoting people whom everybody knows. You know, Crow, uh, um, I'm trying to think of what the guy, there's a couple of, Ono oh and, uh, uh, the guy who invented um, the, or who discussed the concept of uh, neutral mutation, um, 
a Japanese fellow, begins with M, but I can't remember his name. Uh, it's three syllables, and I don't remember. But anyway, and there's, um, uh, I mean, uh, these people are, Kondrashev is, is, is standard. He's, you know, these people are authorities in the field. And what he's pointing out that actually Fisher is perfectly right as long as you assume that beneficial mutations are equal to deleterious mutations. You take that assumption away and all of a sudden the population collapses. Whereas if you assume that they're equal, except for the really bad ones, which anybody can get rid of, if, if you assume that the beneficial mutations are just as frequent as the other ones, then natural selection can move things along and at the speed of the genetic variance. Uh, it is mathematically provable. You just have to make the illogical assumption that, that when you kick a radio, you're as likely to do help as you are to do harm. <laughs> well, when, when you take into account uh, 100 mutations per generation in a human, uh, this becomes deleterious very soon. Why have we survived uh, 6,000 years? Well, actually, actually 6,000 is not too hard. Uh, 12,000 is starting to get a little bit dicey. 100,000, you're probably, we won't survive. And, and like I say, once you say a population can't live for a million years, then if you see populations, then the entire time frame collapses to you know, maybe 20 million years, because there are there's a species of that that have lived for a half the time scale, and others that have lived for another half the time scale. Well, that means two million years max. Well, all of a sudden, all this stuff about how this is, you know, uh, 500 million years old, you're starting to go, no, that doesn't compute. It couldn't survive, and that's why Sanford can stand there and say, well, I just don't believe your dates because they're not, they're consistent. not consistent with the genetic evidence. And once you do that, um, then, uh, then you might as well, you know, if you're gonna get hung for stealing a lamb, you might as well steal a sheep. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just go the whole way. Say creationism in some reasonable form is the most likely theory. Um, so as somebody who's trained in public health, I sort of need to, to respond here that the um, replacement fertility rate is the number of uh, children that a, 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 that a female has in, in, on average in the population. And it needs to be above like 2.1. You need to have 2.1 children in order to just mm -hmm. maintain the population size. And uh, that, the reason for the point one is for, to account for deaths in childhood and, right. and young right. adulthood right. and stuff. Right, exactly. Uh, and if you take a look at the female fertility rate for different countries over time, um, it, it is going down dramatically and pa it shoots, slices right through 2.1 without pausing, you know. Women don't say, should I have a child? Well, let me, let me look at the statistics and determine whether I should or not. You know, that's not, not the way they look at it. So um, there, there are a number of factors such as female education, which dramatically impacts the number of children that uh, a woman would have. The more educated, the less children uh, that they have. Uh, and during the uh, sort of transition in the 60s and 70s, it's demographic transition is different for different countries, but uh, the, uh, as there's more urbanization uh, and more education, uh, and uh, with, like with urbanization, when, when it sort of becomes expensive where children are uh, an expense, not a benefit. They're not on the farm helping you become more wealthy. Um, then those rates drop at, at a, a faster rate than could be explained by genetic degradation. It's the the right. social factors are dominant. Although to be fair to that, uh, to the other side on that, if you're having a quarter of your population trying fertility, then either they're not getting pregnant early enough 
or um, they're flat out infertile and and a quarter of the population becoming infertile is a major Substance. problem if you're looking at keeping the population going. But they're not infertile. They're simply using birth control or choosing, they're delaying children. These yeah, sorts of you're probably right that uh, it's easier to have kids when you're younger and people are delaying it until they're 35 and then they, they can't have kids. And then they're trying whatever they can to get them. Uh, so that there is, some of this is environmental. Uh, some of this is probably hereditary though and more of it than we like to admit and uh, I think that eventually it will catch up with us. Yeah. It's, mu it's multifactorial but I think that the social, but, the choices yeah. mm -hmm. uh, is, is dominant probably 90% or more. But yeah. We need to have 100 offsprings for every person we have to dismaintain normal population. I mean a, a normal a genetic uh, uh, no, it's more than a hundred. More than a hundred, yeah. If you have a hundred mutations per, then the bell curve says, uh, or the, or more precisely, Poisson st statistics say that the chances of getting one are basically zero. They're not. They're not one in a hundred. They're one in well, e to the one hundredth, or thereabouts. The probability of getting uh, the, the the zero. Um, is um, uh, yeah, it's it's um, it's uh, one over e to the minus lambda. So if lambda is a hundred, it's e to the minus one hundred. Uh, it's actually e to the yeah. one hundredth, one over e to the one hundredth, and uh, that's a very very small number. And only, and it's like ten. It's like ten to the thirtieth, or something like that. So, and no woman is going to have ten to the thirtieth children. I mean, it's just that's I mean, not I mean, happening. I mean, uh, um, that's not true. E even even no guy is going to have ten to the thirtieth that's, children. But uh, that's not true. How are you going to control your population when you start having that many offspring? Well, the, the idea is that uh, hopefully most of them die before they have kids. Yeah, you have to you have to <laughs> kill off almost everybody, the, uh, except for the one perfect guy or gal. But, um, Paul, Paul, what you said is not true. Uh, somewhere in the world, every 16 seconds, a woman gives birth to a child. And if we could just find that woman, get her to stop, would solve the world population problem. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, did you want to say something? <laughs> Did you? I have a very yes. I have a very simple thing to say because I'm not a scientist. I I love your title. Because if you if you don't have the backdrop that you have and someone is talking to you or starts talking, um, I I loved I loved the title. Evolution is not inevitable. Well, uh, scientists have shown you could add that to the front. Yeah, and yeah. It, it, Fisher it, it, thought he had proved it. And if you give his assumptions, uh, I think he probably did. It's just that the assumptions are wrong. And we know that now. And, uh, and, and that's important because there are people who will come up to you and say evolution is inevitable. It was proven in 1930. 2.5. Oh, yeah. Well, how does that work? Well, it's simple. You have variations and you have natural selection and the natural selection, uh, the improvement of the species is proportional to the variation. And you can show that. And, yeah? As long as the, there's no mutations, and you don't run out of, I mean, you, you actually have to have all of the possibilities already present there. But those are totally unrealistic assumptions. Did he know that? When we don't understand that at the base of this is digital code. 
And <laughs> when we don't understand how the variations are there in the first place, and you just kind of take them as givens, then it's tempting to go that route. Once you realize that we're dealing with digital code, once you realize that the chances of mutation that are positive to that code are approximately less than one in a million, and one in a thousand will kill you, then the idea that we've been here for a long time <coughs> is just ludicrous, let alone that we've improved. Like I say, the water strider is losing ground to the river. He did not swim up the stream, up the middle of the river, number one. And number two, if he keeps going, he's going over the falls. He probably fell off the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, you can hypothesize that you're going up, up the side no, of the river, down. and that's probably reasonable. But the middle of the river, no, and that's where he is right now. And evolution has been assumed to be this just irresistible force. And it's not. It's not only not irresistible, it is actively being resisted to the point where it is losing ground. Go ahead. That's the point. That's the point. I think, well, let's go back to spermatogenesis. Um, what we eat, what we eat, and how the sperms behave are correlated. How the sperms can go in an acidic mm -hmm. environment, can go up, what is speed, depends on what kind of food we put in our mouth. Mm -hmm. Same with the ovum uh, production. How come folk in Europe, by the time they are whatever, th 30 years old, they, they cannot almost produce? I mean, sperm, uh, ovum uh, production. Go to go to Thailand, and these folk are fertile till they're 46 years old. I mean, it's really, truly, it has been proven that what we eat makes us who we are, both males and females, in terms of how many sperms is produced and what the effect, uh, how how healthy the sperms are. Two tails, two heads, mm -hmm. all kinds of crazy things happen mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. It depends on what we eat. And the Lord says, for I give you fruits, nuts, and grains to eat. But we yeah. have changed our eating well, habits and we pay the price. Well, the, the thing of it is, even <coughs> if we were to eat perfectly, we would still be going downhill. Yes. You know, that, that says the water strider is trying to swim uphill, it'll still go downhill. What happens if the water turns around and swims downhill? Well, it just goes downhill faster. faster. <laughs> and frankly, you can swim downhill faster than you can go uphill. Right. Um, because it's a lot easier to damage by either genetic or by food, or maybe both, because some of the foods we eat actually damage our genetics as well. Absolutely, And so yes. there's an interaction. The thing of it is it's multifactorial. Right. But the single most important factor is that you can't improve the genetics, and in fact, we're losing ground. Right. And, it, and over millions of years, it doesn't matter. See, you know, it's like the guy who, uh, who, uh, you know, is losing money on, on his Apple sales and tries to make up for it on volume. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you go downhill faster. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, 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 uh, I, I mean, and the fact of the matter is we all intuitively know this, yeah. including the U.S. government, including so everybody, that if we really know. thought that mutations were the ground for evolution, then what we should do is go in x-ray machines every day so that really? we can make more mutations. Yeah. That's right. And everybody knows that that's the way not to make yourself better, but to kill yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's 
It's totally nuts. The problem is that there are people who need us to believe in God and in fact who have come to the point where they know that it's a God to what I would call moral certainty. And you see, you look at the fossil record and there's parts where there's no life. And there's parts where there's microscopic life. And there's parts where there's Phanerozoic life and if you blind yourself to all of the other phyla and concentrate only on the vertebrates because we're the only important ones, right? Uh, then you can get, you know, fish and then um, amphibians and then reptiles and birds and then mammals and then primates and then uh, uh, apes and then ape men and then humans and uh, who knows where we're going from there. And see, that's the fact and once you assume that fact, well, we must have gotten there, and it couldn't have been God, and therefore Ronald Fisher must have been right in his conclusion, even if the math doesn't work. Yeah, because it's not taking into context. Because you are assuming facts that, if I can say that way, are not in evidence, but that you really want to believe. See, and that's how, the, that's how you can be certain that this works. It's not, because, it's not because it actually follows from the evidence, it's because you know that you need to get from point A to point B, and so there must be a path, and so we've just got to find it. And once you realize that that is the mindset that is taking place, you can say, well, you know, we have a right to be a little skeptical of those conclusions. Because the fact of the matter is you can't get from A to C, you can't get from C to D, you can't get from D to E, and you can't get from D to B. And if that's the case, then why are we insisting that we got from A to B? Well, because look at the fossil record. And of course, the the the, the question that you can ask, and it's a perfectly reasonable question is, well, maybe somebody did that. <laughs> but we're not going there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you see, as long as you refuse to accept that there's evidence of a creator, then you're stuck yeah. with evolution. <laughs> and once you realize that, I think that evolution loses its power because it is no longer the conclusion of a bunch of people who have impartially studied this. It's, just, it's the conclusion of some people who need to have the conclusion and therefore finding the best way they can to get there. Hitler had said... Really. Hitler had said... Yeah, says but if, if you refuse to accept the gospel, you get pushed into... Yeah an evolutionary scenario. Because there is no other answer. Well, it's not a good answer either, but it's the best answer they got. And as long as, you're, as long as your criterion for truth is it's the best answer we've got, you don't have any defense against it. So in a sense, really, the gospel frees us to see truth for what it is. Yes. In a sense, the gospel frees us to see truth for what it is. Amen. I, I just cannot help it, but just make a comment. Hitler has says, if you tell, if you tell a lie, big lie, often enough, people will believe it. So what's happening today in the media everywhere? Well, it has to be. If you're not an evolutionist, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. But uh, for you're Bunker, stupid, insane, or wicked. Right. There you are. But for overwhelming uh, evidence. Wicked. Yeah. Overwhelming evidence. Otherwise, yeah. if, no. you, if, you, if you watch no. CNN all the time, you're going to hate, hate our president. It doesn't matter. In fact, <laughs> you give him all the time and it shouldn't happen. We sh uh, the species shouldn't exist, species which is, as I say, exist. why Sanford is a creationist. Yes. Anyway, Thank you. next week we'll be discussing a book on humans and apes and various things. And <laughs> we'll probably... <laughs> Yes, uh, eight men or whatever will we'll 
I think that the first chapter, the first chapter will be on Neanderthals, so we'll, we'll come back to there. Okay.